Hello and welcome to southern Utah. Just standing just above the banks of the Fremont River here. Looking south, you might be able to make out the snow-capped peaks of the Henry Mountains uh, just above these bluffs here. And we're right here along Highway 24, which is one of the main roadways in this part of the state that links up uh, different areas like Hanksville to some of the national parks like Capitol Reef. And I thought we'd stop at this outcrop here and look at the rocks and maybe figure out what we can interpret about their origin and their geologic history. So let's go over here and, and take a look. Uh, of course, there's just so many layers of sedimentary rocks in southern Utah. It's, it's challenging, uh, even for me as a geologist, to kind of keep track of which is which. Um, so let's go ahead and, and look at this up close and, and see what we can come up with. So I think that probably the most striking thing that you'll see is there's a lot of little white lines just sort of crisscrossing this rock uh, in different ways. And we'll, we'll come back and look at those here in a second. But let's just look at the overall nature of this outcrop. And it's good to kind of see things at a variety of scales. We can see that it's got several different colors of reds and beige, uh, kind of tans that make up the this unit. Uh, we can also see that it's layered, like all sedimentary rocks. We call that bedding. So each one of these individual layers is what we call a bed. And that would represent a, it may be one or maybe several depositional events that have laid down those layers. We can also characterize the thickness of the beds. It looks like we would probably call this thinly bedded because the beds are generally, you know, a few inches, maybe up to a foot. Um, but generally <clears throat> not that massive. Um, and we can see at least here, it, it is making somewhat of a cliff, although it is also sort of sloughing off and, and making a, a slope as well. So let's take a look at this and make some observations and then I'll, I'll put this into a bigger sort of regional context that hopefully will make some sense. So the brown layers in here are incredibly crumbly for the most part. Uh, the really, there's actually another layer or another kind of level of bedding within the brown layers. You can see these almost like paper thin um, lines running through it there. This looks like this is mostly mudstone. It's smooth to the touch. It's not gritty like sand. Uh, as we get to some of these brown layers that stick out a little bit more, these are maybe fine sands. Um, but yeah, I think it's mostly fine sand, mudstone that kind of is uh, interbedded through here, going on and on and on through, the, through these layers. Then I think um, the thing you're probably real interested in are these white layers. If you look close, they, they're almost fibrous. There's lines running up and down them. Some of them are parallel to bedding, but in places they cut across the beds as well. Um, so here's one here where it's actually cutting across the bedding. And I think in some places, I think I saw some around the corner. Yeah, there's places where they're much steeper uh, and maybe nearly vertical. And let's see if we can get one of these little chips of this white material out of the rock. There's one. And look at it up closely. And this is actually, if you use your fingernail and drag it across this stuff, a little hard to do with one hand your fingernail scratches this. And so this is actually a mineral called gypsum. So we've got some either beds, or in this case, what I would call veins of gypsum, because we've got places where the gypsum is cutting across the rock layers there. So we've got gypsum beds and veins. We've got the mudstone and the sandstone, um, just sort of uh, variably, bedded, making up much of this deposit. So when we think about energy, then we think about uh, how much energy does it take to move mud and fine sand? And the answer, of course, is not much energy at all. You can actually move those particle sizes fairly easily. So we definitely need some sort of environment in which we can transport that sediment uh, pretty easily and then deposit it. And then we need some sort of story or interpretation that can also account for these really quite attractive uh, gypsum beds that are crisscrossing 
through this unit. Um, so let's step over here and I'll give you a bit more of the story here. So these rocks that we've been looking at are Jurassic in age. And during this specific period of the Jurassic, let me take you to a map here that will hopefully shed some light. This is some uh, wonderful paleogeographic maps that a former grad professor I had at NAU, Northern Arizona University, uh, Ron Blakey put together. These are really helpful in just interpreting uh, environments and helping people visualize what things were like. So here's the state of Utah right here on this map. This is North America and at the time North America was much closer to the equator. It's also partly turned on its side but the important point here is during this time period and this map's from about 160 million years ago there was a arm of the ocean, an incursion of the sea that stretched down into what's now the Rocky Mountain region. Now this specific map doesn't show it coming quite down as far as we are here in Hanksville, but you can imagine this thing growing a little bit further and covering this region. And what we see here with these units is that this isn't exactly marine rocks. These are actually rocks that were deposited in a tidal flat. So in places, I looked around, but I didn't see any here. There's places where we get uh, ripple marks and the gypsum and some other features that indicates that this was a region near the ocean where it was heavily influenced by the rise and fall of the tides. And as a, as a tide would rise and fall, that would move uh, the mud and the fine sand around a little bit and deposit these, this material. I'm sure this unit also has some fossils that also uh, support that interpretation as well. But notice here on this map, there's no Rocky Mountains. Uh, the big mountains were right here in Idaho and central Nevada. California's over here, so mo much of California, Oregon, and Washington uh, didn't exist, at least as we know it today. So this was a time when the western U.S. was kind of coming into its own and being assembled, but the Rockies had not been uplifted yet, and it was actually a low area where this arm of the sea came down during the Jurassic period um, and formed this low area. Of course, this is gonna be important later. Um, well, not just during the Jurassic, but also in the Cretaceous, because this low area becomes the habitat for a lot of dinosaurs. It becomes the, the lake bottoms, the floodplains, um, the valleys that the dinosaurs lived in. So, um, so let's go look at uh, the, this rock one more time. And so what this gypsum represents is if you have this warm, shallow seaway that stretches into the continent, when you um, have the, that water become very uh, when the climate's really warm and that water evaporates, that concentrates the, the calcium and the sulfate. That's what this gypsum is made out of. And so this gypsum then becomes an evaporite deposit. So what's happening here is this gypsum has formed after this mud and fine sand had been deposited and was probably cracking. Mud often cracks when it dries. And that allowed at times later a little bit of seawater to seep into those cracks and then evaporate and, and precipitate out this gypsum here along these cracks and these bedding planes. So th these represent a post-depositional um, deposit that sort of infiltrated the existing mudstone and sandstone to form these, these very obvious and somewhat conspicuous um, gypsum veins and beds here. So this is a unit in the Colorado Plateau stratigraphy called the Somerville Formation. It sits just below the Morrison Formation, at least in this area. And we're going to go look at that next, but I'll probably do a separate video on that. And the Morrison Formation <clears throat> is known for being uh, one of the best units to look for fossils in. Um, I don't, I'm not expecting to find dinosaur fossils there, but I think it has some other interesting uh, units and some characteristics that want to explore. So I'll head there for another video, but for now, just a lovely little outcrop along Highway 24, <clears throat> uh, the Somerville Formation, a Jurassic Age deposit with its alternating uh, light and dark layers of sandstone, fine-grained sandstone and mudstone, and then these really kind of pretty 
and um, uh, just really obvious gypsum veins and beds that crisscross it. So we'll uh, tune off for now, head out, and uh, we'll see you at the next stop for another video.